It's very nice to be here. I think my last conference pre-pandemic was here at ICTP. Um, so it's, it's nice that my first conference post-pandemic in person is back here. I'm only worried that the sea seems to have been occupied by giant jellyfish in the meantime. OK, so I'm going to talk today about lots of things beginning with R, about reset, which we've already heard about, about run and tumble dynamics, which was sort of alluded to before, but I'll say a little bit more about it, and about mathematical modeling of that with renewal reward processes. But before I get into the details, I want to sort of introduce the various words you saw in the title of the talk. There we are. So current fluctuations. The idea is that we're interested in currents in stochastic particle systems, but not just in expected values of currents, but in their distributions probability of seeing a current away from the mean. And to set the scene, think for now of a process without memory of a time homogeneous Markov chain, so discrete time. And you can think about the current between two states in the chain, or for example, between two sites on a lattice, simply by counting minus one when a particle jumps back across the bond between the sites, and plus one when a particle jumps forward. So it's like counting the cars that go past you on the road. And if you do this for some number of time steps, you'll have an integrated current. And as we know, in non-equilibrium systems, one typically has non-zero mean currents, so some kind of flow. But more than that, in Markov processes, the distribution of the time average current, so if I take my time integrated current for n time steps, and divide by the number of steps I've measured it for, that generically obeys a so-called large deviation principle, which very loosely speaking means that in the long time limit, the probability that the time average current takes some particular value j looks asymptotically like the exponential of minus some rate function, some function of j, i of j, multiplied by the number of time steps or the time n. So this rate function quantifies how likely you are to see a fluctuation away from the mean. You can also think back to what you do in undergraduate probability courses and think about characterizing the distribution with a generating function. So I can define a generating function as the expectation of the exponential of some conjugate parameter k multiplied by my time integrated current. And in the long time limit, that also has a scaling form with some function in the exponent, this lambda thing, that's known as the scaled cumulant generating function. And you can write that more formally as this limit. And these things might seem a bit formal, but actually they give you some insight into the structure of non-equilibrium statistical mechanics. In particular, this scaled cumulant generating function plays a role that's analogous to the free energy in equilibrium. And it's related to the rate function by Legendre transform. In particular, if it's differentiable, then via Legendre eventual transform, I get the rate function in this way. If the scale cumulant generating function is not differentiable, then the Legendre eventual transform only gives, in fact, the convex hull. And in general, just like thinking back to equilibrium, actually, non-analytical points in lambda k correspond to phase transitions. Now they correspond to so-called dynamical phase transitions. So that's the kind of picture for Markov processes. The question now is, well, what happens if we add some form of memory or some form of reset? And we've already heard about reset in the last talk, so I can do a fairly brief introduction. Reset could be as simple as resetting a sign, resetting an internal clock, resetting some dynamics. The classic case, of course, is to take a particle or a searcher and put it back to a fixed state. But you can also think of restoring a system to, to some known distribution. And very many examples, as we had nicely explained a few moments ago. 
And in the first part of today's talk, I'm going to talk about reset dynamics and phase transitions. And then in the second part of the talk, we'll get on to run and tumble processes. And the idea here is that this is a sort of cartoon picture of how bacteria move. So bacteria tends to move in a particular direction for some randomly distributed length of time, and then it sort of stops and has a kind of dizzy fit and throws its flagella around and tumbles and chooses a different direction and then tends to move in that direction for a bit. And this actually is connected to reset processes. It's a kind of reset process where the thing that you're resetting is not the position of the particle, but its preferred direction. And you can use very similar mathematical formalism to treat this kind of process. And I'm going to be interested in a, a sort of general class of run and tumble models that consist of some known Markov process with a preferred direction. So you can think if you want to be concrete of a random walk, but it could be something much more complicated punctuated by stochastic resets of that preferred direction. So the parts between the resets we call runs, and the resets in this language we call tumbles. If the length of time between the resets is geometrically distributed in discrete time, or exponentially distributed in continuous time, then of course the process is still Markov, but on an extended state space. Not Markov if you just think about position, but if you include the preferred direction, then you're back to a Markov process. But if the length of time between the resets is not geometrically distributed, not exponentially distributed, you have something more complicated. And the second part of the talk, I'm going to talk about something called the thermodynamic uncertainty relation for this class of models. Okay. So that's sort of where we're going. We've done the introduction, and then we'll have these two parts. So the first part, phase transitions. And what I want to do here is to show that there's a, there's a connection, actually, between these relatively recent models of reset with a very old model, a 50-year-old model now, of DNA denaturation, and how we can basically steal a lot of results from this old model and apply them uh, to the reset model. And this is work with Hugo Touchet from a few years ago. Okay, so back to our, our reset framework. We're going to, again going to start with a Markov chain evolving in discrete time. But now we're going to allow that the transition probabilities might have some weak time dependence in such a way that there's still a well-defined stationary state. And again, we're going to count the integrated current after n time steps. And we're going to assume that even with these weakly time-dependent transition probabilities that are chosen in such a way that there's a generating function like we saw before with this large deviation scaling form. And I just put in a, a zero here to indicate that this is the generating function for the process without reset. Now we add on top of that reset in the following way. At every time step, with probability f, we reset the process. That means that there's no current that flows. The current stays at whatever value we've measured so far, but there's no increment in the current. And the process is reset, perhaps by resetting these transition probabilities or by putting a particle back to a particular place, something like this. And with probability 1 minus f, the process just evolves in its ordinary way, and the current is incremented. And the question is, how does the generating function change when we add the, this reset. In particular, what we do here is we say, well, in the long time limit, there are lots of sort of finite time corrections that don't matter. But if we keep resetting our original process, then perhaps those finite time contributions do play a role. And in particular, is there a phase transition to some regime where current fluctuations are optimally realized by having trajectories that just don't reset at all? And it turns out that this question is connected, perhaps surprisingly, to this very old model of DNA. So here's a kind of schematic of DNA. And you'll remember that DNA has this helix structure with two strands, and the two strands 
uh, are connected by bonds between pairs of monomers. And if you heat up the DNA, then at some point, the bonds start to break. So you get these kind of bubbles of bits of the DNA where the bonds have broken. That's called denaturation. And typically in these models, when you reach some critical temperature, the whole thing just kind of unzips all at once. And actually, that phase transition is related to the kind of phase transition I'm interested in. So let's see that a little bit more concretely. The claim is that the generating function in my model maps to the partition function in this old model, this poland sheringer model of DNA. So on the top here, you see a cartoon of the poland sheringer model. So the horizontal lines you can think of as the two strands of the DNA, and they're linked by bonds, which in some cases are attached, and in other cases are broken. You have these bubbles where the DNA is starting to pull apart. And what I do now is I map the space axis here to a time axis in my model. And the parts of the DNA where the bonds are connected, I map to time steps where there's reset in my model and the current stays at whatever value it's currently got. So this is current on the y-axis. And the parts of the DNA where the bonds are separated, I map to time steps where there's no reset and the current increments. So here we go up a bit and then the current comes down. Now we have another couple of time steps, three time steps with reset. And now the process starts again and the current increments. So just understand, so if the next thing is denaturated, it's up or uh, otherwise down? Uh, no, so if, if it's denaturated, the current just evolves in its ordinary way, so the current could go up, up or down. So, yeah. For example, for a random walk, yeah. It, you, know, you can have plus one or minus one. Whereas if it's not denaturated, the current is just zero because you're having the reset. And in the PS model, you're interested in phase transitions as a function of temperature, and the order parameter is the fraction of bound monomers. In our model, we're interested in phase transitions now as a function of this conjugate parameter, K, these dynamical phase transitions, and the order parameter, by analogy, is the fraction of steps where we have reset. And once you've made this mapping, you can essentially just carry across a lot of calculations from the PS model. And the way it works is the following. First of all, I try and write down the current generating function for a loop of n consecutive steps without reset. Well, that's very easy because I already defined my generating function for the process without reset, and then I just have the probability that I have n steps without reset. So that's this thing I've called u here. And then I do the same for a period of n consecutive reset steps. And unfortunately, with the scaling we've got at the moment, this is disappeared off the bottom. But fortunately, it's super easy. If I have n consecutive reset steps, then there's no current. So I just need the probability that there are n steps with reset. So that's f to the n. So imagine there's an f to the n down here, and you won't go far wrong. So I have these pieces, the generating function for the part with reset and without reset. And I want to sort of put those together to get the generating function for the whole thing. But it's a bit tricky because the pieces have got to add up to the time I'm interested in. And of course, the trick there, the same as the trick in the PS model and in many other models, is that we do a discrete Laplace transform so that the total number of time steps now fluctuates and we don't have to worry about this constraint on the length. So this is the thing I really want, the generating function with reset. Here's its Laplace transform, G tilde, and here are the Laplace transforms of the loops without reset and the parts with reset. And the part with reset is so easy, you can do it already. And now, if we try and put these bits together to calculate G tilde, you see it's actually very easy because every history of the process consists of alternating segments of reset, no reset, reset, no reset, 
and so on. So you end up just doing a geometric sum. And you can find very simply that G tilde has this form. So you see the familiar geometric denominator and the numerator just comes from boundary terms. And actually, you don't even have to do the inverse Laplace transform to find the long time behavior. You can get the scale cumulant generating function directly. It's determined by the largest, with my sign convention, the largest real Z at which this object diverges. And in the absence of a phase transition, that's super easy. This diverges when the bottom is zero. Let's call that value of z, z star. And the scale cumulant generating function is then just the log of z star. On the other hand, it can be that as you change k, before you get to z star, when you're coming down from infinite z, you hit the point at which u tilde diverges. You can show you never have to worry about v tilde, but u tilde might diverge first. And at that point, at that boundary point, you get a crossover to a different form of the scale cumulant generating function. And it's very easy to see that actually that just corresponds to the scale cumulant generating function for the process without reset, plus the price you pay per time step for not resetting. So at this value of k where you see this crossover between the, the poles where this thing diverges, you have a phase transition to a, re a regime where the cheapest way to realize your current fluctuation is just not to reset at all and to pay the price for doing that. Hello. Small pause. See if it works in an old fashioned way. Nope. <laughs> Ah, it's come back to life now. There just, just seems to be some kind of stochast stochastic delay. Um, okay, where were we? Here we are. And from this mapping, you get not just the existence of phase transitions, but you're able to classify them. I don't have time to go into the details. But it turns out that that depends on the, the corrections the subleading terms in the generating function for the sections without reset. So this is what we're used to, the part without reset, probability of not resetting. There will be some finite time corrections, and if they have a power law that goes as minus c, c which depends gen generally on the value of k, then it's this exponent here that determines the nature of the phase transition. And you can show that if the exponent is less than or equal to 1, you don't have a phase transition at all. If it's greater than 1 but less than or equal to 2, you have a continuous dynamical phase transition. And if it's greater than 2, you have a first-order phase transition where you have a, a cusp, a kink, in the scale cumulant generating function. And that all comes exactly from an analogous treatment of the PS model. The only difference here is that our exponent in general depends on k. And you can check that with very simple models. So here's about the simplest thing you can think of. Supposing you take a random walk where the ith jump after the last reset always has a step length that's drawn from a Gaussian distribution with mean zero, but variance that depends on the time since the reset and approaches, as you'll see, a constant. And then you can do all the calculations, and you can compare them with numerics for the scale cumulant generating function. If b equals 0, you just, of course, have an ordinary random walk, and you have the blue line, which is perfectly smooth, nothing to see there. If b is a bit bigger, so the dependence on the time since the reset is a bit stronger, you see this orange line, which at some point at this blob has a transition to hit the black line. And the black line corresponds to the scale cumulant generating function without reset at all. But everything is smooth here. If B is even bigger, that's the green line, you see again a transition to the case without reset, but now with a, a non-differentiable point with a kink coming in here. 
So that all seems to work. Another thing you can do is check results from elsewhere. So here's an application that takes us back to uh, Run and Tumble. Run and Tumble, as I said, is just resetting the direction. And you can modify the previous framework. And it turns out to be easier to consider tumble and runs as combined events. But then you can do exactly the same thing. And what you find there is that you recover some results calculated in a quite different way by Christian van der Broek and collaborators that predict the order of a dynamical phase transition in this run and tumble model depending on the dimension. And that all comes very nicely out of our framework. OK, and then don't worry, I see them waving a sign at me. And uh, the second part, much shorter. I want to tell you something about thermodynamic uncertainty in these kind of run and tumble processes. That's work with a former PhD student, Mayank Shrestha. OK, so what are thermodynamic uncertainty relations? Well, they compare the value of the mean current and the scaled variance, so the variance divided by time. And they give you a measure of uncertainty or precision, depending on which way up you compare these things. And you can do them in continuous time or in discrete time. So for the ordinary Markovian case, you have a now very well-established relation for continuous time, which puts a bound on this fraction, j bar squared, over the scale variance in terms of the entropy production. Tells you that if you want to have a more precise current, so you want this variance to be smaller, you need to pay a larger thermodynamic cost. In discrete time, there's a different bound, again due, due to Christian van der Broek, uh, which you can check. So this is ordinary random walk taken from the original paper, and the red line is the left-hand side of this thing, and on the right-hand side, the green line gives you the bound. And this works for any current. Question then is, what about run and tumble dynamics? Well, you can actually do some exact things. You can treat the model as a renewal process with time between tumbles, time between renewals, some random variable capital N. And then the current at time t, could be discrete or continuous, I don't mind too much at the moment, is just a sum of the currents from all of the different runs, so capital M is the number of tumbles up to time t, plus the bit of current from the last tumble. And furthermore, we assume, for the kind of models we're interested in, that the current for each run is a random variable that has a multiplicative structure. It's a product of capital T, which depends only on the tumble, so setting a direction, for example, and capital R, which depends only on the run. Then you can use machinery of renewal reward theory to get exact results for the asymptotic mean and the scale variance in terms of a whole bunch of moments. So you have to know moments of T and R and N and cross moments, but if you know those things, you can actually calculate uh, the uncertainty exactly. The question is, well, what if you don't know those things? Can you still do something? Or if you only know some of them? Well, if you're happy to assume that the R part of your current, the current part that's related to the run, that the mean of that and the var scale variance of that, that they scale with the length of the run, which is true for random warp models. The length of the run is n minus 1, because you have one time step for the tumble itself. Uh, it's exactly true for random warp models and expected to be a good approximation for other models, um, at least for long run lengths. If you assume that, then you can get a simpler expression for the asymptotic mean current. And you can neglect some terms and get a bound on the scale variance. And then you can combine that with the original discrete time Frozen's van der Broek bound on the tumble process, which is an ordinary Markov process, to get a bound on the uncertainty in the whole model. 
And this is very nice because you don't now need to know the statistics of this R thing for the runs. You've just got a uh, pre-factor which depends on the statistics of the run lengths and an entropic term that involves the tumble fluctuations. So I see you're writing something, but I am very nearly done. <laughs> it's because I, I have to click twice to get through every slide. That's my excuse. Um, and you can check this. Um, simple as possible example, perhaps a um, random walk with geometrically distributed tumbles, um, where in each run you have a preferred direction and a probability p prime of going in that preferred direction. And the preferred direction is set right with probability p at each tumble or left with probability 1 minus p. And capital T is just plus or minus 1. So you have a bias in the tumbles as well as the runs. And if you then plot this uncertainty thing, well, the green points are from simulation, the blue is the exact thing, which you can calculate in this case, and the red dashed line is our bound. The black line, by the way, is the original Prosman's van der Broek bound, using the fact that this is Markov on an extended state space. So it still works, but it's pretty useless, apart from very close to biases of 0 and 1. So this is a function of the tumble bias. And you can do also non-geometrically distributed run lengths. Works very nicely. You can do many particle models. You can do continuous time. And again, the bound works. But I think I am out of time. So hopefully I've convinced you that you have this nice mapping uh, for the partition function in this old DNA model to the current generating function in a reset model. And there's various other things you can do. I saw that Francesco was loitering online. You can think about large deviations of ratio quantities and non-homogeneous reset. And then I talked about thermodynamic uncertainty and what you learn from renewal reward processes. But there are many other properties you can think about for these run and tumble processes. And there's some work with Edgar and friends trying to unpick some of those that's ongoing. But let me stop there. Thank you very much. You were still on time for the break. Yeah, so not for the questions. No. Uh, we, we still have time for a couple of quick questions. Uh, Still shy. Any questions? Yeah, Marco. In, in the Thomas Schneider model, there is the possibility of changing the critical exponents of this uh, free phase uh, by producing Stefan There was a paper by Mukam and Felicia at the beginning of the 2016. So the phase transition changes because of that. It becomes sort of further from Stefan mm. Do you have the chance of doing something similar in your model? Yeah, so that's basically what, what we did um, in. In, there, um, in this random warp model. Um, so the step length depends on, on, on this parameter to B, uh, which in some sense quantifies the memory since the last, last uh, reset. Um, and by tuning that, you, you can tune the nature of the, of the phase transition. Um, because you change, as you do that, you change this, this C, this power here. So I think in the, in the Muckamel thing you're, you're referring to, they sort of by hand change the exponent for the, for the loops we change the exponent that comes in here by this slightly more indirect way by changing the, the, um, the time dependence of the steps since reset, and, and you get the same thing. Uh, the only difference in the, in the PS model is that they always have a constant here. They never have a dependence on temperature, whereas we have a dependence on our, our conjugate parameters, so it's a little bit more complicated. Satisfied? <laughs> Good. Any other questions? Yes, Andrea. actually genuinely one of those, those um, moments where somehow I just made a connection. I think uh, Dorito was, was explaining to me the PS model for some totally unconnected reason, and I'd been thinking about reset. And as soon as you see that it's just mapping time to space, space to time, then, then you've essentially got everything. Well, it's a bit perverse, this idea. You know, I, I would have uh, you know, the mapping I had in mind is what I, what I was telling yeah. you. I mean, then I could you could go down now, but you know, the, the process stops and the current that phases the free phase is a bit uh, you know, 
Yeah, maybe my mind just works in a perverse way. Is, 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 is this what you're saying, Andrew? <laughs> Yeah, we should talk about it. Any other questions? Any questions in the chat? Does someone see that? Okay, so this means if there are questions, you can send Sarah an email. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, I can't, I can't see the bottom of my slides, let alone the chat. So, um. so I, I can ask a chat, I mean, on the chat and see whether it appears. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, I don't have any instructions for the break. Andrea, do you want to say something or just leave the room? Good. Then let's thank all the speakers again. And we reconvene at...